Welcome, everyone. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas uh, to the Friday lecture of the Center for Latin American Studies. We had a technical difficulty at the beginning. I have already read a land acknowledgement and uh, have introduced uh, uh, the, the, the logistics of how to submit questions into the chat at YouTube for those who are there. Uh, but I do want to move on with our speaker today. Uh, Odilla Romero is the co-founder and executive director of Comunidades Indígenas en Liderazgo, Cielo. She's also an independent interpreter of Zapotec, Spanish and English for indigenous communities in the Los Angeles area and throughout California. Organizing indigenous migrant communities has been a part of her work uh, for over a decade, I would say quite more than that, since I think I met you. Among her numerous academic publications, awards and lectures, she has been a lecturer at Johns Hopkins University, at USC, at UCLA. Uh, Ms. Romero has published on the challenge of organizing indigenous communities, developing women's leadership, and preserving the culture of indigenous communities. She has been featured in many news stories in Los Angeles Times, New York Times, Walk, Time Magazine, Democracy Now. Um, so please give a welcome to Odilia Romero. How are you? Okay. I am having technical difficulties. Sarah, how does this work? Sorry, one more time. Pa dios yo escribí la bachirenga, dije Benetzet, Benetzet. I'm sure you didn't understand what I said, right? Um, uh, what I literally said is, uh, thank you for us being here together in the house where people study. Um, and I'll start with that because um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the work that we do at Cielo, but also. Um, and you're probably wondering why my title is like that, but you'll find out as we go through this conversation. Um, uh, at Cielo, one of our main work is language. Uh, uh, we focus on language, so I'm going to start with a, a, a historical context, and then I was really shocked by a map that um, Alberto showed us this morning. Uh, because then now I have a tool to show like how our language has been used against us or language has been used against indigenous people since the invasion, right? Um, by no means I'm a historian, so um, this is from Odilia's and Cielo's uh, team perspective, from a community perspective. Uh, so for us, it's very important to go back to thinking about the historical context of language and the, how powerful it is and what it means, what it meant back then, and what it means today. When we talk about the first interpreter in the world, we always talk about the Malinche, right? Mm -hmm. And she does not have a good reputation, by no means, you know, um, but we have to consider that she was probably 13, 14, 12 year old little girl who was in the middle of a war, was forced to interpret however she could. She was forced to create words, maybe describe words, and it must have been a terrible thing that she went through as a young woman having to interpret for Cortez and, and for her people. You know, God knows what people t t thought about her in that moment. We know what Mexicans think about her because every time that you do something or, you know, uh, there's that word like, no seas malinchista, don't be a malinche, don't be a traitor. That's how Mexico sees her. But for us, we see her in a different way as a young child who was enslaved, 
who was exchanged and had to interpret. And she was put in a very important position, just like every children since the invasion until today, in the courthouse in the next city here by Stanford, right? That child continues to interpret, children continue to interpret for their parents in hospitals, in consulates. Nothing has changed since the invasion for indigenous people. And, you know, we have survived 530 years of linguistic violence. It's, that's what we call it. Uh, and people, you know, there's a whole movement about language justice, but language justice has not included us as indigenous people. This violence and this racism is endured in every process of the language movement. And it leads to our losing our lands, right? Um, I could use an example today that then Maya, there were no train, uh, there were no trained interpreters that were there when the assembly was done by the Mexican government. There was no educated decision from the community on the use of their land. So that's how powerful language is. That the trend's going to happen no matter what I say or what we say, and we could do protests at a binational protest, that's not going to change because those agreements have been signed. And now we're seeing more people from that region migrating to the U.S., right? So, um, and I think, um, you know, um, Alberto, you really alter my presentation. I want you to know that because I we had this idea and we had, like, how people see our language as a something secondary, as something not important. And we saw it in LA County um, not too long ago when the elected officials talked about us as short and ugly as indigenous people. I mean, it hasn't changed from what Alberto showed us this morning. Like, you really alter my, I, I just, um, my, my entire presentation because it was very impactful the image that he showed us this morning for those of us that went to his talk about, you know, they're thinking like, you know, we're speaking ugly languages, right? From those snakes. But hey, the snakes are sacred to some indigenous people. So, um, but I think it's that, it's the racism that comes with the language and how the uh, invaders thought about us, about our language, and we have it. It impacts us today here in the U.S., as a migrant indigenous people. And that's why for Cielo, it's fundamental for us to fight for indigenous people's language rights here, in courts, in hospital, in different institutions. And I'm sure you all know that a lot of the children that are detained, that people talk about the unaccompanied minors, most of them are minds that are monolingual. And they don't have interpreters. And what happens with that is that they don't have a right to an asylum or it minimizes that asylum. So language is very powerful. And the state has used it violently against indigenous people to, from land, uh, from your right. I mean, if you don't speak the dominant language, you don't know you have rights, right? Um, so uh, if you guys have questions on this, I could answer them now. Or, or no, right? That's not the question. <laughs> Whichever you want. But okay. <laughs> You know, and when I talk about a language, we have to think about Oaxaca. Like, for example, we have more than 500 concessions to international mining companies. And none of these was consentful because there were no interpreters. There were kids, there were family members, there were community members. And I think uh, we have excellent uh, interpreters in this room that could attest to one word makes a difference in someone's life. One word makes a difference on somebody getting their asylum or conceding their land to a mining company, right? Uh, for us, you know, we're worried in, uh, and same thing happens in the Kichi community. Um, I think was it last year? Yeah. Um, you know, as you saw a lot of the Kichi, uh, a lot of the kids that were detained were from the Kichi region because there was a repression back home um, that had forced those kids 
to be in the detention center when um, we had one in LA and one in, in Pomona. And most of those kids were indigenous people from the Kekchi region. And we know this because we want to interpret. Um, so I think a lot of this, and it all has to go back to language. Same thing with the Mepa community has been um, displaced for, uh, for water because they have, um, you know, aquifers. So all, 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 and then there's a stru structural changes that people, you know, but it all has to do with language at the end of the day, like what, what the role of language that plays in our life. Um, like for example, I migrated during a structural change in, in Mexico in the 80s, you know. Uh, my parents were like late 70s, and most of us don't know, you know, so we're not here for an American dream, like we're being pushed out. We're being pushed out for different reasons. And, um, in the case of Guatemala, you know, it's uh, the war, the persecution, and now the palm oils. You know, people are being, indigenous people are being pushed out. According to the UN, we hold 80% of the world natural resources and we're only 10% of the population. So what that means for us, and at least for Cielo on this side of the border, is that we need to prepare because there will be more indigenous people coming. For example, now we're seeing people from, um, Brazil, we're seeing people from Nicaragua, uh, people that we never saw before, right? And, and, and we know this because the courts call us, and these are the people that will detain uh, miskitos in Chicago, in Miami, so we know more or less where people are, are, are going, but all these, um, you know, the disposition, the criminalization, the structural change in the political um, ambience pushes people out. And then um, the other thing that we work is creating a narrative. I, I think somebody uh, told me this morning, like, you're very popular. And and it's not that I'm popular. I mean, it, 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 it's a pain to go to these places, but we see them as infiltrations uh, because we need to create visibility of our existence. Uh, in the U.S., we talk about us uh, as indigenous people, as Latinos, right? There's no, in the paperwork, and I'm sure you all, University students look at the paperwork. Is there a space where it says if you're Zapotec, Mepao, or anything, you know, you're either Latino or Mexican, but there's no room for you to be who you are, in my case, Zapotec. So, um, and, and that dignidad, what, we, what I say is that it kills, right? Because the narrative um, that is said about us is like I always joke about this, but it's real, okay? Um, on September 16, Independence Day, Every single Latino goes out stressed as an Indian. Everybody wears blouses of an indig of indigenous person, but that's only that day. When it comes to our rights, they don't exist. Um, so um, we try to create like, um, you know, and uh, uh, something that I think that taught, I, I recently was in Mexico City, and when you go to that, would you take that tour in the, um, El, uh, what is it, the uh, Museo de Antropología? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, they talk about the Zapotecs did, the Mexicas did, they did, they existed, they were great, they were smart. And I'm like, uh, hi, I'm still alive, <laughs> you know? Uh, but it's always, they always talk about, about uh, uh, as, as a thing of the past. And um, and it also, you know, this assumption that everybody from come some of the imposed borders speaks Spanish and we go again back to language. Because the assumption that everybody speaks Spanish and that everybody from south of the border is Latino, you know, it creates a problem for indigenous families that have crossed the border too. Because people don't know that there are other languages. They don't know that there's over 20 languages, uh, uh, families of the Mayan languages uh, in Mesoamerica, or they don't know that there's more than 364 languages spoken in the Mexican Republic, right? And, the, and you could see that racism. Like I said, they, they love to drink our mezcal. They love our clothes. They, they love Oaxaca. I mean, every time you go to Instagram, Oaxaca is great. You know, everything about Oaxaca is talked about. But nobody talks about the land, uh, the mining concessions. Nobody talks about the boom of mezcal. is causing water problems. There's a lack of water to communities because the transnational take the water. So that, that, that is not talked about, you know? And, and some of the things that, 
Latinidad, that's to us, it, it, it hurts. It hurts. It separates families in the court. Uh, I'm as an interpreter, I, you know, I get to see a lot of cases, and our whole team gets to see uh, a lot of cases where the assumption that somebody spoke Spanish gave them the wrong amount of medication to a child uh, involved a Department of Social Services, and the kid gets removed, put in a foster care. Uh, often mom gets diagnosed with a mental uh, intellectual delay because she's not responding, she's not participating in the parenting classes, and that's due to lack of interpreter, right? So a lot of these things could be taken, um, prevented if people acknowledge that we exist, that we're not Latinos, and that there's multiple languages that we speak as indigenous people. You guys have any questions? You're really quiet. <laughs> But we are a, a solution-oriented organization. There's a lot of odds um, uh, for indigenous people, but indigenous people are resilient. We shouldn't be, but we are. You know, I wish there was one day that we didn't have to resist. But I think um, I always say this jokingly, you know, um, but it's true that the fact that we're here speaking our language, and that we continue to reorganize. For example, in LA, um, this is a picture of a traditional dance by, by my community. And my community has been here for over 60 years. We have been here since the Bracero program, but we have reorganized. We have a hometown association, there's a board, there's an assemblea. Everything happens like if we were back home. And just like my hometown association, there's many of them in Los Angeles, right? Where there's indigenous people, there's reorganization. Um, we reorganize around the patron saint celebration, um, which is super important, you know, um, to communities now. You know, and I always think of San Bartolome. Yeah, it's, it's the saint, but I'm sure like communities know and by talking to communities. Uh, last year I was part of the board and I don't really like to talk about it because it was like a very sacred, sacred process with the elders, with the community, but there's resistance. And now I understand fully like, yes, it's a saint, it's a colonizer saint, but there's a lot of meaning that the community does not share outside and I'm not gonna share. So, um, but we do organize about the, uh, around the patron saints. Uh, we have over 42 brass bands in, in LA County. That's a lot, um, but we also have the traditional players of Chirimiya, the Mesoamerican instruments. So it's a combination of both. Uh, we have like our traditional dances, and, and, and I'm talking we as people in LA, the Mayans have their events too with their marimbas, and we reorganize. We, we, I, I think we're very resilient, and you know, uh, I, the joke is like, no estamos aquí por blancas palomitas tampoco, you know? We put on a fight. You know, we put on a fight and we continue to put on a fight in different spaces. Uh, for example, one of the works of Cielo has been um, educating the Los Angeles Police Department about our existence and how to better uh, serve indigenous community. It has been very successful, but it's not easy. Like, you guys are, like, very quiet. The police sits like this with the gun in the hand, and they're like, uh-huh, and oh, they're walking, they're like, we're here for the cultural bisectomy. You know, it's been a lot, but the relationship has been, um, happened after the killing of Manuel Jaminez Shum, an indigenous Maya Quiche that they, that they killed. <coughs> after that, we begin a conversation and an education process, and now they call us. We get calls from LAPD every day. We... We are here with a Mayan family. We think it's a Mayan family. We think it's a Zapotec because they go by the map. We did a, a trainings with them. Like this is where this community lives. This is where these other community live. So now they use the map and they, they'll call, they'll call. And I mean, it worries me that I get more calls from LAPD than from the immigrant rights movement or from a hospital. So that's really worrisome. Um, but because racism is there, right? Um, when we migrate, we migrate with the racism. Just that we migrate with our brass band, our food, you know, um, we migrate with our racism too, and that's felt on indigenous people on this side of the border. I don't know if I could open. 
Okay. The map? Yeah. Did Edgar send it to you? Uh -huh. So if you guys have any questions so far? What a quiet group. Yeah, very quiet. <laughs> Well, we figure out if we can get the map up and running. Yeah. Can I ask you what kind of things do officers say when you train them? I mean, it's just such an interesting dimension of going with law enforcement. Well, Cielo is an expert on working with law enforcement, and we don't mean to say that proudly, but it was a lot of work, a lot of um, um, interesting things that happened. Um, you know, but after the shooting, you know, our first workshop with Los Angeles Police Department, a lot of the, the, the police department, I think, I don't quote me on this because I, I don't remember the numbers, but I think they're 50% or 51% Latinos now. Mm -hmm. And out of those, most of them are Mexican descent. Mm -hmm. So having this context out, they, they would say like, I'm from Jalisco, I don't know about indigenous, there's no indigenous people in Jalisco. I'm from Puebla, and there's no indigenous people in Puebla. <laughs> and you would want to, like, exactly that reaction. But one of the officers, actually, uh, Captain Gonzalez, uh, he was like, I'm from this I don't know that there's any indigenous people. He was one of the, our biggest advocates to have a, um, a language card, that they call it, so you'll see it in a, in a minute. Mm. This, is the, this is the map you were talking about. Yeah, but if I could go out, uh, um, there's a language card somewhere. Mm. Alberto, do you know from what you were thinking? Maybe go to the main website, the one which is on, uh, not the RGIS one, but the one in uh, story, uh, <coughs> map, story map. Uh, so yeah, that go one, into the, the top one. one, yeah, the story map one. And then we'll go and scroll down. Yeah. Go down, go down. <laughs> it's further down. Uh, right there. It has been modified. Uh, this is, we created this one before we created the map. So we, we more or less had an idea where indigenous community live based on our experience of interpretation and re uh, interpretation requests. And based on CLO, the CLO team is from the community. That's for us, it's very important. All of us belong to a community. Um, most of us are either bilingual or trilingual, but most important is that we belong to an indigenous community here and back home. And that's key to do the outreach for, for communities. And we based it what, of what we knew, community knowledge of where what were the language? After we did the map, we confirmed it, but also uh, we created um, for them to be able to pronounce, so you speak Kiche, you know, Kanjabal, uh, for them to be able so that they use it so when they have a victim of, a, uh, of a, some type of problem, you know, uh, they will read it to them. And it's been successful, but we really had to sit in these uh, very comfortable conversations, um, Alberto, uh, people, uh, Mexican officers deny like knowing about indigenous people. So we had to do a lot of work. We've been working with them for 10 years. And, and now this map is going to, this language card, it's going to be replicated by other uh, law enforcement uh, in areas where indigenous people are, are located, but it's going to be based on that area, right? Like, for example, this card is no. Will that be useful to the to the tricky to the um, Greenfield Police Department because most of them are trikis or mixtecos? So uh, I mean, but it's you know at one point they walked out on us, Alberto. Actually, now I remember like we were talking about you know the root causes of migration, and one stands up, all of them stood up, and they walk away from us. They left us talking. But now it's in a, we're in a different dynamic. Uh, uh, we get a lot of calls uh, mm -hmm. from them. Um, and some of them, you know, uh, especially in the Quiche, uh, Quiche Campoval, they call, they call us very often. So, 
Yeah. Thank you. Quite a group. Uh huh. Um, I'm wondering. I know you said that the LAPD has access to, to maps, right? And what kind of information is contained in those maps? Well, the map is. This is what. This is all that they could see. Where the community, uh, the languages are spoken in that area. They don't have information, like uh, detailed information about the communities. It, the, whatever you have access to, that's what they have access to. Maybe, maybe you can show them how. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, true. That's what map. I was going to do. Can somebody put it up? I was going to spend a lot of time on this. On the first map? Or on the second? Uh, yeah. So I think when, if you could put it back up, so when we talk about, you know, communities that are resilient, you know, um, go up one more. Um, we, uh, Janet and Mariah did a lot of work on like writing the history of migration of indigenous Zapotecs in that area. I think one more down, please. Um, right there. Yeah, and then we called it like we are here because of this narrative that we existed, that we were, we were smart, we did, but nobody knows like we are here today. And in the case of LA, the food industry, uh, the service industry is run by indigenous people. Like everywhere you go in LA, if you pay close attention, you know, you will hear different indigenous languages. If you ever go to LA and you go have a street taco, pay attention to the language. Most of the taqueros are indigenous mijas. Yeah, uh, that, and, but people assume that they're Latinos, right? No, the taqueros are mijas. And look at the colors of the trucks. Look at the colors uh, that they're using. You know, everything is there that shows you that they're indigenous. Uh, from the mountains, uh, uh, from the mountains, from the colors of their flag, uh, from the name like Tamix, you know, look at the name, pay attention to to those details, and you will know that they're indigenous people. I think we've been very good about rewriting our history multiple times since the invasion. We saw it on the maps that Alberto showed us today, you know, but we also see it in in when you go to Los Angeles, you know, you'll see like. Uh, Carniceria la y la Azteca. That's a, a, a way of rewriting history, right? Or everything has an indigenous name, but people just don't pay attention. I, I, I think. I like my, it's ringing. So I think. Um, am I able? If you go further down, all the way yeah. to the bottom, there there's the, the one with colors further down. Yeah, further down, yeah. And you guys all could go play with this map uh, at another time too, but um, you know it, it's um, it gives you an idea. We identify seventeen indigenous languages, the families that are spoken in LA, and in and for you all linguists, I know it's important to say like what variant and where they are, but for Western world, as indigenous people, we make have to make a five percent threshold. Otherwise, we don't get services in our languages. So the map is called, like, you know, we, we use indigenous people. So we could, so we could meet the criteria to receive services for indigenous people. Because if I use, like, for example, um, my partner and I were both Zapotec, but we could never have a conversation in Zapotec. I mean, we don't even agree on the chili he cooks in, you know? With, so um, we will never have anything in our in our uh, our kid's name is in his language Biani in my language is Benny so we can even agree on his name <laughs> um, so you could see this map and the blue ones I believe there are Chinantec there's a large population of Chinantec and if they, you click on the red one Zapotec And if you click on, a, on another, any color, it will tell you what language is spoken. There. 
And for those of uh, uh, you who are in, have indigenous background, you know where you find one Zapotec, you're going to find 10 more, and you're going to find an entire pueblo, or where you find a mixteco, there's a whole community living there. So this is just like very minimal numbers of our existence in LA County, but we also know there's a lot more. For example, um, I could use like maybe my community, uh, we're probably in the thousands, like fourth generation, right? But not every, but so, but we are here in, in, in LA County, a large, like from the San Gabriel Valley to the San Fernando Valley to Long Beach, we are in every part of that city. So when the city come and ask and they're like, where should we focus our efforts to service indigenous people? My answer is always the whole county. Like, like what institutions would they go more to? Like what institutions do you go to? Do you go to DMV? Do you go to a hospital? We are in all those spaces too. Okay. You had a, um, I, I, I hope you go and play around with the map because it has like also, um, oh, is that better? Yeah, much better. <laughs> so as you can see, we're all over LA City, LA County. And if we had the funds, we would do the entire California, and you would see as like the people that pick your wine up in Napa Valley are mixtecos and triquis, you know? Uh, the people that pick our fruits are also triquis in the, green, in, the, in the great salad bowl. The people that pack our food are indigenous people, and the people that serve our food are indigenous people in a city of like LA. Is, is this map where we can also see the place names that you have documented, or that's separate? That, that's separate. Okay. Will you share us about that? <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, I'm not allowed to share it because... Oh, that, not that, share it, or tell us about it. No? That Janet's working on... Janet, um, the vice director of Cielo, she's the one that worked on the map. Mm -hmm. um, the, the younger generation has like a lot more talent in technology. She worked with on this map with... Uh, um, with Mariah Tso, who is a Diné woman, so it was by, done by two indigenous women, which I, I thought it was very powerful because um, that uh, work amongst two two nations, I thought it was very important. So, <laughs> but no, we're not. We're, the, our map has to do with the language and migration, like where are people going, what are the languages are being requested. So they're working on on a, uh, on a new map about it, about the data that we collect from the different courthouses across the nation and what the famous NDAs allow us to document, right? Because when you have NDAs, you can't document a lot of stuff. So we're using what we have to create a, a new map. If you go, go down. On the entire page? Yeah. I mean, you guys could all go play with this map in, in, in and, and going back to language, like when the pandemic hit, like there was no information in indigenous languages. We would hear like, oh, somebody died at the garment industry again. And thousands of people, of indigenous people died, but there was no way to document because they were Latinos, right? So that's the dangers of Latinidad. We, we don't have much data about our existence. And I think this community data, this map was done by the community, with the community, but this is it. Um, but during that pandemic, like it, it was a great opportunity for us in the sense that we were able to collect the data. We created uh, the different um, COVID messages in different indigenous language uh, with the support of the community, with our interpreters department, but we had to create. We couldn't wait for the state and at the end of the day, we know that the state's not gonna come and save us. You know, it's the community that's going to come together to to continue the work. So we created the, the first ones from where we had zero finance to where we were able to hire indigenous illustrators to create a um, map. And we had a lot of, I don't know if, um, do you, uh, are you able to play one of those videos? Do you have a preference? No. It's just to see like what we had to come up with in the middle of a pandemic as people were 
Now these are new videos, okay? Okay. It's just an image, I think. Okay, yeah, I think they, they removed them. Um, and if you go further down, please. And, you know, dur during the, um, and through the map, we were able to find, to document with numbers um, and with images of where we knew where communities were, right? Like, we know. We know who works in the garment industry, we know who works in the restaurant industry, but there was no way to prove it. So with this map, we were able to see, uh, as we had suspected, that a lot of the indigenous people work in the restaurant industry, uh, in, the, in the cleaning industry, childcare, but the majority are in the service industry. And we were able to point that out, and that's how we were able to get access to vaccines, to indigenous communities, uh, since the vaccine became available, we uh, vaccinated more than 17,000 indigenous people uh, through interpreters, through doing outreach in the community itself. If you could put another one. And if you click on this, um, this, uh, this one was the Oaxacan Heritage Month back in the days, and you click on the different, like the our, uh, our interpreters, um, conference, uh, maybe um, our literature conference. It's important who makes the maps, right, Alberto? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Oro, who is an, uh, the most, the, our, the grandfather of and grandmother of indigenous organizations here, uh, as, a, as a, not the hometown association, but or, uh, organization. Um, if you click on one, please. Oh, there was one, I think um, there's a whole thing about, uh, maybe two or three, I don't remember. So you go and you'll learn about different histories of indigenous resistance in LA County. So we're really excited about that. If you could put another page down. Uh, yeah, there's a conversation with, um, uh, there's in, also, Sorry. oh yeah. Can we go back up? Yes, please. So the, the, this is for the Canjobal community. So different communities uh, gave us their archive to put on the, on the map. And if more come in and say like, I want my information on the map, then it's put, but um, this map was really community-based, community-organized, and, you know, um, it, it was because of language. Every one of us spoke the, the language of the community. I mean, for those people that are from indigenous communities, you know how hard it is to get information from the community and how hard it is for them to agree to sign a document saying, is it okay if I collect this data, right? I don't think this would have been possible if we did not speak the language and we, if we didn't belong to the community. I think it was very important that we belong to the community ourselves to be able to do that work. I think that made a big difference. Um, I think an academic told me, you have like a gold mine in the data. Can we work together? I said, no, it's community-based. <coughs> like, I'm sorry, like we made a commitment to the community that we would be doing the project, so that was, like, sorry, friends. <laughs> if you could put an, another one. And then, um, I think that's the end of the map. You could go and look at it, but for us, as, as Cielo, it's very important to work with the community, from with members of the community. You know, we always need allies. We always need our, our ally linguists. But also, one of the things we ask is, like, how do you give back, like, you people in this house of study, how do you give back to the community, right? I think for me, um, it was um, the map that Alberto showed us this morning. It's important for the community to know that, what those maps say of their history, right? But we never have access to them. I didn't even know they existed. I knew of some, but when we brought one of the, the dress and codex, to the community, 
uh, well, a copy of it, not the codex. Mm -hmm. You know, some people cried. Like, you know, some of the community members did cry and said, like, we've never seen it. You know, we've heard of these places. We knew about this in oral history, but we've never seen it. So I think it's important for you all to give back that knowledge that was extracted from the community. At the end of the day, it was extracted. I think uh, you share like how you did that translation and interpretation of an item that should go back to the community. How do we bring these academics? How do you all go back to give back what was extracted from the community, right? How do you support us? I always say like, from where we are in this side of uh, the struggle, which is we don't have the time to read all these documents, you know, because we have to respond to somebody dying at the border. We have to respond to somebody, that a body that needs to be repatriated. We need to go to a courthouse because there's an indigenous person detained. You know, uh, we need to support someone in something. It's so we're stringing up fires. You know, but on top of it, we need to learn how to navigate the police system. Or we need to, like, how can you support us on this side of the struggle, right? Our work is very time-consuming. Um, I've been trying to read a novel for the last two months, and I only read it in the airplane. Because when I'm at the office, I have to respond to office things, you know, but also... Like, this is such an important information that you all have access to. Like, how do you share it with the rest of us? That picture of the language just gave me, like, the chills. And I'm going to ask Alberto to go and give us a workshop on that because that is felt today. How they see us, how they see our language, how it's all about extraction. It's being seen today. Here. You know, do you all drink wine? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> but how often do we know that the grape pickers work at night? Right? And their labor laws are not respected at night. You know, people that uh, the watchdogs for labor rights are not going to go at night to make sure that the workers are well, right? So I think all that we have to take, I mean, I do enjoy wine, so I try to be conscious about it, but I, but I think is that like, how, we don't know like what indigenous people go through and who produces your food, who picks your, your wine, who packages it, or who serves it, right? That's really important. I think you creating, being alert on who serves you, that's your service, who cleans your house. It's very important to know that most of us are indigenous peoples. <clears throat> and language is very important. Questions? There's something in the back, yeah. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much for uh, your presentation. I've been a gratifier of your work for many years, um, and, and, and Janet's work as well. Um, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit, a little bit more about, uh, I know that Seattle also offered uh, indigenous language classes. And so, um, yeah, if you can talk more about the, the language transmission, what has been kind of like the responses, especially from the youth. I'm gonna play devil's advocate here and say, you know, somebody will if you could hear a presentation and say, well, wouldn't it just be easier if these people learn Spanish, if they learn English? And part of the struggle here too, you know, when you migrate is trying to um, assimilate, there's also discrimination. My mother says that she felt more discrimination in the United States, not from um, white people, but from Mexican people, like you said, right? Someone from Jalisco, oh, you're from Oaxaca, I don't know if they're from indigenous people, you know, that um, discrimination. So my question is, um, you know, what has, how has the youth in your, uh, in the communities and the organization responded to language classes and how do we advocate for language transmission? Because at least in my community and my work as well, uh, or uh, my community work, it's it's hard to convince the, the youth, you know, to, to learn this language because a lot of them are oral languages, um, it's already hard to just keep up with Spanish, um, and you know, I mean, in your case, uh, from what I know, right, you're trilingual, Spanish, English, and Zapotec, so how do we get to, to your level set and convince you to do that? Well, in my case, it's very particular, right, because I, I, I was born in, in a community back home, and I was there until the age of 10. 
So I learned the language. I lived the language. And by coming here, being on the lingo was quite a violent process. And I, because suddenly uh, I became Mexican, Latina, Hispanic. But luckily, in my case, is that my pueblo thinks it's the best pueblo in the Sierra. And we would, that would always be the thing. There would be like, wherever you go, you're still going to be a, a woman, from, a person from Sogocho, and we're like the best thing. We're like, so the best parties. We, we are that thing, you know? So that was very helpful for my survival. Because even though I didn't understand, at that time I didn't have the words for bullying. I didn't know it was bullying. I didn't know it was discrimination. I just knew how it made me feel when people would laugh if I spoke Zapotec or if I spoke broken Spanish. It was the feeling, but I didn't have a name for it. And I think um, because my community migrated a little bit earlier and the migration continued during the 80s and after the NAFTA agreement that was like the final migration process, we stayed together. You know, and they began to have parties, they began to reorganize, there was already organization, so I, I, I think that was my life-saving um, thing because I grew up there, but also uh, Janet, you know, I didn't teach her the language. And actually, Janet learned Spanish until recently because we wanted to make sure she learned English so she didn't have to go through what we went through. Because it, it's no fun to be monolingual in the U.S. or anywhere in the world uh, and people bullying you, making fun of you. My mom always shares this story like it took her like many, many years uh, to be able to respond to a man from Jalisco that would tell her, why are you Oaxaca so ugly? and short. Same words that we heard from the woman from Zacatecan descent in LA City, right? Um, and she said it took her many years to sell it to tell him, well you're short and ugly too and you're from Jalisco, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it wasn't immediate until she was able to learn um, to speak a little bit more in Spanish and she was able to respond. Meanwhile she had to endure that language of violence against her every day at the garment industry. And that makes a, a difference, but I think, I'm talking about 42 years ago, um, it was really hard to be indigenous, right? It was really hard to speak the language to, or, or to even wear the wipiles. But now I think there's a whole other movement, and I think um, I don't belong to the organization anymore, but I think the FIOB had a lot to do with the visibility of the Wipiles. I remember going around uh, California with the first language classes with Rufino Dominguez, with Juan Julian Caballero, were like encouraging indigenous mixtecs to continue the language. I think they set a precedent at that time. And after going in that route, I'm like, well, we need to do something with our language. So we started inviting um, Maestro Filemon from my from my community, who's an elder, and we be we began to have like conversations with the community and said like, what about the language? And the young people are like, we want to relearn the language. And now like you go around LA City, you hear people on the phone speaking the language, or in their traditional regalia, and there's a whole a movement of wanting to reconnect with the language, right? A lot of the kids understand the language because it was still spoken at home. They just don't know how to speak it. So with Cielo, we have our language classes during the summer. And uh, for those who speak Zapotec, or my variant of Zapotec, uh, we develop a, 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 a loteria. It's not available yet, but you're able to play it in a computer, and you could be in Sogocho, you could be in Oaxaca City, or Nesa, or in LA to connect with other Sogochenses. Um, it really took us a lot of work and, and you know, with Maestro Filemon and young people from the community, they developed a loteria. So we're really excited. We were hoping it was going to be ready this month, but you know, um, logistical stuff of webs. But it should be up soon. But I think um, for us, it's important and to transmit the language. It's hard, but I am very hopeful that the language will survive here because there's a whole movement of kids wanting to relearn it. And, and I, I and I think we. 
we have to continue doing like narrative work about, about our existence, about the importance and about our resistance, right? And we could see it with the map that we were shown today, like the communities knew how to infiltrate these colonizers system. And the fact that we continue to be here today, it shows that, that, that we, we're quite cabrones, you know? <laughs> and too, like this is important and we need to teach the kids and we need to share these stories and this knowledge that it's um, hidden in these institutions in order for the language to survive. You all need to go out there. You know, La Cochawaya has an amazing history, right? Like how many of the kids know it or the, the resistance of the now is like, how do we go to those communities? You that hold the knowledge, you that have the, the items, you have the maps, the codexes, how did you go like this is your people? Uh, um, so I think that that's important. It, it, it's a, a combination of things, but I think we're in a good movement where people, young people like yourselves are wearing the wipiles, you want to relearn the language, go back and ask your mom about the history of your pueblo. You know, there's always oral histories um, that they talk about and that they're dying out because we don't ask about them. And I think they're... I, I'm a really I'm a uh, optimist uh, 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 optimistic individual, so I'm really really thinking that the language is going to survive here. Yes. I have a lot of questions. I just firstly want to say thank you so much for um, sharing all this. It's really beautiful to hear that. And I'm just wondering, are you from uh, Sierra Norte? Uh, my parents are from there too. Ah uh, yes, I'm from Sierra Norte. I'm from Soloch. Uh, my parents are from uh, Yetzikobi, San Bonitzikobi. Okay, it's on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, I just, um, I am an undergraduate and I'm starting a new like organization on campus with other people um, called like Center of Indigenous Students of the Americas. And I just want to be here if you have more advice on like bringing in indigenous languages and um, like how to find instructors specifically because we're thinking of bringing, uh, we want to learn like stuff like that. Well, Zapotec is such a unique language, right? Mm -hmm. Because it has over a hundred variants, uh, and we cannot make one Zapotec. So uh, I would say if you, if the majority of the people here are th that understand the variant, that's what you look at, right? Like for us, we brought Mr. Philemon because he at least understood like four language, four communities around us. Because that's a very, uh, the thing about that, and again, I'm not a linguist, but you know, we don't, we can't communicate in one Zapotec. Oh, I don't know if the Nahuas are the same. Yeah? Um, we have intelligibility. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Each other. So, but you have an ally here with Alberto. You know, to set up your classes. <laughs> I'm gonna put him on the spot right there. <coughs> Select, yeah, of course. Thank you so much um, for, for your talk. Um, I, I wanted to ask more about the um, interpreting training process. I've worked as a freelance Kachikel Mayan interpreter. One of the questions that comes up is how do you translate and interpret in culturally relevant and culturally responsive ways? Um, and so I wanted to know more about the, the process and if you create you know, terms or dictionaries and in these languages, how do you approach or how do you train in interpreters? Oh, our interpreters are trained by weekly, by uh, twice a month, in different topics because it's really hard to figure out how to say uh, calendar, right? It, it, how do you say that in, in indigenous language? And I know a calendar is a calendar for all of you guys. Um, the majority of people, but for those of us who are interpreters, a list of names in in a courthouse. Uh, so it's not to say you, I mean, for, for all of you here who are not interpreted, it's just a calendar, like, you know, the Gregorian calendar, but it's not the same thing in a court or an immigration court. And that makes a difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for us, it's really hard to find the meaning to it in indigenous languages or in asylum or this word that they use in, um, remind me, what is it? Probable fear, probable fear, probable, yeah, right, it's probable, credible fear. Like, how do you say that in indigenous language? Miedo creíble in Spanish, but what does that even mean? Right? 
for you to get an asylum, you will have to be able to tell uh, a story, in our case, a story about why are you running from home? Why do you need an asylum? You mostly have to describe what is a credible fear because there's not a direct translation from Spanish to English. So I think uh, for us, it's very, we train, like we sit and think about this. I was, um, we sit and think like, how would we say this? Does this make sense? How would you say it? Even if like uh, you speak Nahuatl and you speak, what do you speak right now? Tzatzat. Like jail. In my language, I say the house of metal. How would you say it? Porsche. But literally is. Did uh, you say hospital? Or no, Jay, that's it. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, literally, it's like the, the place where you find something. Uh, I think it's difficult in Nahuatl, but we have a verb called sacua that is like to, to close, to shoot the house. <laughs> yeah, like for us, it's the house of metal, mm -hmm. you know, or the, the house with uh, iron, right? So that's a jail. But you, at least, you know, you, you have to sit and think about it. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot borrow from Spanish because then the person is not understanding. You say like, oh, I'm going to uh, uh, put you in jail and carcel and you just borrow. That you're not doing anything. You're contributing to the language violence against indigenous people. So I, I think training and thinking, really thinking how do I say this uh, word. I was just telling Alberto this morning that for us, you know, inter misinterpretation happened from day one. Like where what bene washa for us is the daykeeper bene is persona wa is guardador a keeper ja is day so a daykeeper well the spanish called the brujo well no it's not brujo you know or um sonar it's like the version of atlatuani a female and they interpret it to virgen well, no, it's not Virgen. It's a powerful woman. Or a uh, priest is somebody that makes you tremble. Fruits. Fruits is this. Right? So it's a person that causes fear. You know, we have to really rethink and break down the words. Like, what do they mean? What did they mean then and what do they mean now? And how do we create it? And I think interpretation is like being a doctor. You constantly have to learn, read, and no attack on you, but I really think indigenous people need to be trained to be interpreters. I don't care who has a PhD. It's the lived experience of an indigenous person that makes you a good interpreter. All you need is the skills. All you need is support system. I will tell you the story of Alba. She was a detained child. She's one of the only female Kiché interpreters that we have trained, that I work very closely with, judges love her because she's such a professional at it. She, she doesn't know a word. She asks for clarification. I mean, she's an amazing interpreter out there. But she was not born an interpreter. She was given the tools, but she has the experience of being detained. She knows what the children go through. You know, she knows what it is to be in that center, being in that yelera, having to eat frozen food, so she knows how to interpret that, you know? So I, I, I think it's really important that if you're an ally, help the next interpreter train and take a step back. So I, We're I, done? No, I have to stop the broadcast section. We can oh. still have a few more questions that we can have here with the audience in public. We try to keep the broadcast section uh, of, the, of the speaker for one hour. So before I thank our speaker, I do want to remind you for the rest of the quarter here at class, we will have a couple of events that are not on the Friday. There will be Dr. Norman Ray, who is the former minister president of Galapagos Government Council, who's speaking on March 6th at 10.30. That's a Monday, so it's an unusual time. And the other event we will have is a conversatorio with Juez Miguel Angel Galvez, one of the most important judges um, in the Otto uh, uh, Molina case in, in um, uh, Guatemala. And uh, he's speaking on March 16th uh, from 2 to 4, and that's going to be in Encina Hall. So thank you so much, Odilia. Okay. And we will continue the conversation in a second.
¿Cómo va? No, está bien, pensé que bien aquí. Ok. Había una pregunta de este lado. Jaime. Jaime, ya. Yeah, uh, thank you. And a question to me in Spanish or English. Yeah, for 